A few times when I was a kid, I suffered from dangerously high fevers that I believe were brought on by chronic tonsillitis. Um, I eventually had my tonsils taken out at the age of 26. A very nasty business at that age, I might add. Um, but nothing compared to the terrors that I had to endure uh, with uh, those fevers. Now, that's just delirium. Uh, that's the unfortunate uh, corollary to fever, any kind of raising of the temperature of your body to a dangerous level, uh, especially if your brain, I guess, gets heated up to a certain point, it ceases to function correctly, and uh, it's sending out danger signals throughout your central nervous system. Your central nervous system is stimulated to the absolute maximum. You've got to cool down or you will die. So in cases like that, what I, in one case, what I did was I simply tore all my clothes off and ran out into a, into the cold night, um, and came to. So I'm like, what am I doing here? What was that horrif horrifying fear that I just felt that was simply more than I could possibly bear? And why do I feel so wonderful all of a sudden <laughs> now that this is over? And wait a minute, I don't have any clothes on. I'm standing here in my underwear in a basketball court. What, what you know, it was just a, I, a sudden bout of complete and total insanity, but there was a reason for it, of course. Um, in a couple of cases, my mother said, don't worry, you were delirious. It's That's over with. Um, later on, um, because, of, I guess, of my cursed um, curiosity, the, the un, uh, unsatisfiable curiosity in my character, and my tendency to sort of want to analyze everything, um, I thought, what was that that I saw? What was that that I experienced? That moment of primal, um, mind-blowing, overwhelming terror and panic and doom. What was that? I understand what brought it on, but that's not the whole story. Um, this is what brought the thing on, but what was the thing itself? What was the experience itself? Using modern, you know, language that I've learned as an adult, um, what was the quale, or what were the qualia of dealing with that, or of experiencing that? Um, what was that state? Um, when I suffered from panic as an adult, I went to see a psychotherapist, and they, of course, explain the mechanism of panic, and they tell you uh, what causes it, and how it's actually fundamentally harmless, and um, how, uh, you know, you'll get through it. And <laughs> later on, I watched the, the movie uh, Analyze This, where um, Robert De Niro plays a, a mob boss who has a panic attack, and the doctor just says, oh, don't worry, it was a panic attack. And being a wise guy, he has his guys just beat up the doctor because the doctor is sort of saying, you panicked. It was sort of a blow to his ego. But it's also, if you ask me, an interesting um, statement on the futility of trying to get people to take you seriously when you're trying to explain something as severe as a panic attack, especially an existential panic attack. Um, the horrific inevitability of the panic, the doom that's coming uh, upon you at that moment, uh, in that moment of existential panic. I remember feeling that as a kid when I was trying to explain to people what I just felt. I was trying to explain to my friends, my brothers and sisters, and uh, my brother and sister, I only have one of each, um, <clears throat> and sort of saying, you, you've no idea how bad that was. It, it defies description, uh, how, how terrifying that, that experience is. It's simply more than words can, can express. And, you know, you keep on about it, and you know in your little kid mind that you're not getting through to people. I knew that. Um, that I wasn't getting through to my parents when I was trying to explain to them that what did I see? What was that? What they would say is, that didn't happen, essentially. Now, okay, I understand that. If you're, if you're, you know, 99 kids out of 100, you just sort of say, ah, my parents are smart, it didn't happen, I just think that it happened. But I, I guess, uh, I, I've always been an arrogant person, 
And I guess even as a kid, I was arrogant because I said, you know, I'd be thinking, no, they don't know what they're talking about. Of course I saw it. If ever I had ever any experience of experiencing or any evidence to experience of, of it, ever, oh, if I ever had any evidence that I ever experienced anything, it was that <laughs> because that was real. That was having your head held underwater while uh, somebody is uh, applying red hot sheets of metal to your feet at the same time. It's that level of stress and terror. And, you know, if you have sort of unlimited faith in adults and your parents, and they say that didn't happen, well, it didn't happen. But I remember thinking, no, it did happen. They are simply wrong. They are consummately wrong, and I can't make them understand what it was like. Uh, another movie, As Good As It Gets, uh, where... Uh, where um, Jack Nicholson is complaining about he's trying to express his feelings to somebody and he says look you're just not getting this I'm drowning here and you're describing the water you know it, it, it's all very well to talk about these things and, and explaining the mechanism of terror and the mechanism of drowning and the mechanism the biological uh, uh, explanations for everything okay I understand that a a raised temperature causes your brain to malfunction and it generates all kinds of crazy experiences okay <laughs> um, you might say where the experiences came from but you're not explaining what those experiences are you can only tell me that the experience didn't happen and hope that I believe it well I didn't believe it I, in, in a certain sense I still don't believe that that didn't happen that I didn't experience that and as a, you know you, you sort of think you're just trivializing this you're you, you're dismissing it you're I'm drowning and you're describing the water you're saying well yeah adrenaline um, fever uh, central nervous system uh, uh, fight-or-flight response uh, your body needs to cool off so you'll just do anything and you know autonomic nervous system and all this stuff all right I get all that I understand all of that but what was all these what were all these stimuli working on? They were working on me. This was happening to me. This was happening to a real entity here that felt all of that stuff. Um, and, and again, you can't help thinking you're either A, you're trivializing it. You're saying that this, what you went through, is perfectly natural and not to be taken all that seriously, where everything that you can possibly think of tells you that this was a significant event. It was so horrific. Um, or or B, and and this is in many ways even worse. They don't even know, and I can't make them know. I am alone in this. I am completely and utterly alone. I'm uh, the person wandering through a crowd of people. And I alone know the horrific truth of all of this. Uh, that's the feeling that you get. You say, either A, they don't feel this and only I am subject to these horrors, or we're all subject to these horrors. It's all inevitable. It's our lot. And they simply can't see it. But they will. <laughs> um, that's kind of one of the one of the classic symptoms, I guess, of, a, of the depressed mind is you alone see things clearly. You alone see how horrific reality is, and <clears throat> that may in part stem from my experiences with panic as a child. Was my attempts to come to terms with. Uh, and, and by the way, this may have happened long before I was sort of a, a conscious or I don't know what you'd call it, a developed entity. Uh, when I was two years old, I nearly died several times because I had uh, lung infections that saw me rush to the hospital. And they said that uh, a little baby, you could count my ribs as a little baby trying to breathe. I was being smothered, suffocated. And they said that the screaming was incredible uh, when you know, when I was being put into the oxygen tent to make sure that I was alive and that sort of thing. Now, I, I don't remember any of this, or at least I don't think I remember any of this, but that might have been a formative um, 
uh, element, a centrally formative element in my personality or my world view. And again, so this constant recurrence of brain fevers or um, terrifying illnesses, truly, truly terrifying illnesses, that I had to suffer alone, utterly alone, um, may, have, uh, may have sort of permanently marked me. I don't know. Um, but what it, what it, a, a theme that is throughout my, my thinking, uh, to this day is this idea of primal horror. What, what is that? And again, I understand the, the, the mechanism behind it. I understand the, the, uh, the adaptive game that took place when, you know, Darwinian theory comes in, you, you know, stimulus response action, you know, uh, I'm laying under 1500 blankets in a bed and I'm sweating and I'm still feeling cold and suddenly my body says you're dangerously overheating you've got to get out of bed so you jump out you throw all the blankets off you yank all your clothes off and you rush out into the cold night I get all that I understand why that happens it's um, it's a biological mechanism that says you know your, your temperature's got to come down or something bad is going to happen to you alright and it used the horror to stimulate me that's fine that explains the processes that took place to bring that horror about. What was the horror? <laughs> what was that whip that was being picked up to whip me into action? I don't want to say why was the whip being applied. What was the whip? I'm drowning. What does that mean? I don't want to know that <laughs> it, you know, I already know that my, you know, what, what the biological processes of drowning are, but the experience of it is quite another matter entirely. And when you try to explain things like that to people, they don't get it. And I guess that's one of the things about trauma, is this sense of being completely alone with it. Um, nobody else understands. And when they do try and explain something to you, and they're trying to help you, by the way, um, they speak in such a way that tends to feel as though, it make, make you feel as though they're trivializing it. They're saying, it didn't happen. Don't worry about it. It was nothing. What are you talking about? <laughs> it was nothing. Do you realize what I've just been through? You don't realize what I've just been through. Oh my God. Now you want to talk about feeling completely alone in the world. It's the old moment uh, when you're a kid and you wake up in a room full of sleeping people and you alone are awake and for some reason the fact that they're asleep makes them not there um, they uh, no matter what uh, you know you're, you're alone and if the demons the monster that's under the bed comes out to get you the fact that they're asleep um, means that they are not there they're, they're not there to assist you when the monster comes after you you know that kind of feeling and that's what you get when you're, you're trying to um, well not always but th that's what you end up feeling in that kind of circumstance when you're trying to explain to people what you felt or what you saw or what you experienced. You feel like they're trivializing it. Or, or as I say, you feel as though they don't get it. They, 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 you can't even make them see. And I think that fundamentally alters your personality. Um, it fundamentally it may end up creating some sort of Asperger-like or Asperger-like uh, um, personality trait in which you believe that there is a fundamental disconnect between yourself and everybody else. Uh, it's it's fundamental to the point where um, there's really no point in attempting to um, in attempting to form sort of lasting connections with other people because in the more in the most important things of your life the most the most formative experiences of your life of your existence in in memory you were completely alone and you attempted to describe this to people who you believed before this happened were very close to you and they either shrugged it off or they didn't get it and you couldn't make them get it um that's kind of what uh, led me to put the amount of weight on actual experience, on actual qualia, 
It's, I think, thinking along these lines. Um, it also, believe it or not, led me uh, to sort of, in a sense, forgive everybody for not getting what I was trying to explain to them. <clears throat> I forgive whatever psychotherapists I had to deal with back in my early 20s, uh, which is kind of an important part of getting over um, this feeling of horrible disconnect, because it can be a feeling of, of powerful betrayal. Um, and I had to forgive the people close to me, because in some way, as a child, you believe that your parents have failed you. Everyone has failed you because they're not getting what you're trying to tell them, or they don't care what's happening. Um, and I had to think this through, and uh, to this day, this this experience has sort of marked me and made these series of experiences rather with primal horror uh, and the sheer loneliness of it all, the sheer horrific loneliness of it all, uh, has affected my personality. But of course, you get over that by sort of saying, okay, it, if they didn't get it, it's because they can't get it. Would I be able to get it if I see somebody else feeling that way? No. Ah, okay. So it doesn't mean that they don't care about me, and it doesn't mean that they're stupid or crazy, or that I am somehow utterly different from the rest of the human race that I'm subject to experiences that nobody else is. It's just that there is this disconnect between my point of view, my qualia, my experiences, and everybody else's. We can describe them, we can communicate on a certain level, but our experiences will be forever our own. And that's just part of the human condition. So, again, yeah, you know, I, I live a relatively well-adjusted life. I, uh, uh, you know, I have a job, I have a wife, I have a house, I have a car, all that kind of thing. Um, and I don't think I could have held down such a normal life if I hadn't come to terms with this fact that, okay, yes, you are alone, but that's, you're only alone in, in, in as much as everybody else is alone. You're, we're all in this boat together because we cannot fundamentally share experiences and we can't really get our experiences across to each other. Language fails at a certain point. <clears throat> That's existential panic and your attempts to describe this to somebody else. In my other videos I was trying to describe existential panic to a few people and they didn't get it because they've never felt it before or maybe because they've never you know, felt it before. I don't have any way of knowing whether or not somebody has felt this. Language fails. Um, I don't, we, we have no way of actually experiencing someone else's experiences, and that's the only way we can tell if they've experienced what we've experienced. That's not, that doesn't mean that people don't care, it doesn't mean that they're apathetic, it doesn't mean that they lack empathy, it doesn't mean that, that, uh, that they're trivializing anything, and it doesn't mean that they don't, you know, they, they, that what you're, what happens to you is irrelevant to them. It's just that's the way humans are. Uh, that's system limitations in, in our ability to perceive and communicate. Um, <clears throat> but fear and panic are real things. And the main thing is, I suppose, is to come to terms with them and to make sure that they don't fundamentally screw up our lives. Uh, that they don't fundamentally dominate us. Um, we have to see them for what they actually are. And the only way to do that, unfortunately, is to keep going back and studying them. Um, and it's not enough to just sort of say that, you know, again, I was being prodded by horrific fear in order to get me to do something, to, to run from the lion that's going to come at me and eat me. Okay, I understand that. I'm, it's necessary for me to be prodded by that fear. What was that fear? <laughs> Science can't tell me that. Uh, biology can't tell me that. Darwin can't tell me that. Um, it's uh, it's something that I think that you've got to you can only sort of come at experientially because that's all that's how it comes at you is as a, is as a profoundly unpleasant experience. And you've got to go back to it and figure it out. What was that? Um, I have no intention of ever succumbing to this. I don't want to just sort of say that is inevitable. I can't do anything about it, and um, it wins. Um, no, that's that's not in the cards, simply because, um, again, the, the subconscious implication is that if I succumb to this, uh, then it wins and it takes over. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to learn not to fear, 
fear. That's kind of strange, but the old saying, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, is actually correct, uh, in my case, or in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> and it, this has to be dealt with on an existential level. I don't see how you can, <laughs> how you can uh, overcome an existential fear other than in, in the existential realm. You have to come at it that way, because the outside, uh, the outside, um, uh, the outside aids that you can reach for, the outside assistance that you can sort of help, you know, ask people for, or go out to medical practitioners, or psychiatrists, or psychologists, or pharmacists, or whatever, it's limited in its effectiveness, because what you're talking about is an experience, and you can't draw some somebody else or something else into your experiences. Um, and that's why I think that this whole idea of existential panic is central. I, I think that a lot more people feel this uh, than are willing to admit. Peter um, Vessel Sopfe, uh, you know, based a lot of his philosophy on how existential panic um, inevitably wins, uh, which I don't agree with, because you can come to terms with it. You can put it in its proper place, uh, and uh, it needn't poison your life to the point where you have to negate everything. It's not an easy process, um, but uh, I can understand how some people can be overwhelmed by it, because it's, it's a, it is an overwhelming, it, it does feel like the unstoppable force when you're in the middle of it. Uh, it's not good to trivialize such things, <laughs> and it's not good to sort of underestimate the power of these things to come back. <laughs> Another ramble, I guess. This one might be rather long, um, but uh, it's... Uh, and, and again, this doesn't even have to be just about existential panic. This can be about ex experience of anything, experience in general. Don't devalue experience, because ultimately it's all we've got. <laughs> Thank you.